Thank you for joining us today at Evangel. We hope our ministry has impacted your life in a positive way. We'd like to invite you to join us for one of our services. On Sunday mornings, we meet at 9.30 a.m. and on Wednesday nights at 6.30 p.m. For more information, you can visit our website at www.evangelonline.net. Thank you for watching and enjoy the message. The king of my heart be the 
lift your voice to the Father who is never going to let you down. He has never let you down. He went and defeated death himself so that he could never let you down. Just lift your voice and lift your hands to heaven and tell him how grateful you are. is yours and the praise is
leaves this morning, Lord. Through your praise, we receive victory. Hey, I want to talk to you. I'm going to start a series on Elijah. This is, I have been thinking about different things to talk about, and we're going to, we're going to talk about navigating life. Uh, how many of you have issues navigating life sometimes, getting through the different days and everything? Well, we're going to be talking about that. The subtitle of today is going to be this, Miracles Can Be Messy. Miracles Can Be Messy. We pray for miracles in our lives, but a lot of times we don't realize that miracles come with difficulty sometimes. Miracles come with challenges. When we think of a miracle, we think of, boom, it's there. You know, it's like rubbing the, the lamp and the genie coming out and, and saying, what do you want? And we give three things and they give us, you know, those wish. Let's just make it happen just like that. But in the kingdom of God, miracles can get messy. Miracles can get messy because there are things 
that we have to go through sometimes to see the fulfillment of a miracle. And we don't want to do that. In Elijah's time, this is something that we're going to talk about. Elijah had to go through some things in his life that made his miracles kind of messy. It was a challenge for him to get through some of the things he had to go through. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me this morning to 1 Kings chapter number 17. And we're going to read some scripture to sort of set this up. And then I'm going to talk to you for the next couple of moments about some principles that will help you when you're looking for a miracle in your life. So 1 Kings chapter 17 says this, Now Elijah the Tishbite of Tishbe in Gilead said to Ahab, Now Ahab is a king. Elisha has just all of a sudden come on the scene. Or Elijah has just all of a sudden come on the scene. And All we know about him is he's a guy that's a Tishbite from Tishbe, and he comes on the scene and he goes to the king, Ahab, who is a very wicked king. And he said, as the Lord God of Israel lives before whom I stand, there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. And the word of the Lord came to him, depart from here and turn eastward and hide yourself by the brook Cherith, which is east of the Jordan. You shall drink from the brook And I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord. And he went and lived by the brook Cherith, that is east of the Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and meat in the evening and morning. And the bread and the meat in the evening, uh, in the evening, and he drank from the brook. And after a while, the brook dried up because there was no rain in the land. I want to stop right there for a little bit of time. Tishbe, as we said, Elijah just all of a sudden sort of shows up. His name means Yahweh is my God. Yahweh is my God. So it tells us a little bit about Elijah that evidently his family had a background of knowledge of God because you wouldn't name your son Yahweh is my God if you didn't kind of have a connection with God in these things. Prophets during this time usually showed up because there was an issue or a situation that needed to be dealt with. They were God's judge, and the book of Judges dealt with that over and over again. So they would show up on scene if there was a situation or a circumstance going on. Chapter 16 and verses uh, 30, somewhere around in there, tells us what was going on. If you want to read this along, you can. It says, And in the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah, Ahab, the son of Omri, began to reign over Israel. And Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel in Samaria 22 years. And Ahab, here we go, here's why Elijah shows up. And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. And as if... uh, And as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, he took for his wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbel, son of Sidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. And he erected an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria. And Ahab made an Asherah. Ahab did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than all the kings who were before him. So Ahab, we find out from this, is a very wicked guy. There had been evil before, but now all of a sudden Ahab shows up on the scene, and it's very interesting that the Bible defines Ahab did more than all of the other kings combined to anger the Lord. Now, he built a a, uh, altar to Baal. Who is Baal? Well, if you look back, Baal was an ancient Canaanite god, and the people, uh, the Jewish people, begin to embrace some of the Baal worship as they begin to fall away from God. Baal, his real name, Baal was a fertility god who was believed to enable the earth to produce crops and the people to produce children. So this is who Baal was. Baal was the god over the crops and also over the fertility. He turned around and he built an Asherah pole. Asherah was also the goddess of fertility and over these types of things. So Baal is saying, you know what? 
You don't have to worry to God about crops. You don't have to worry to God about any of these things. I'm going to build these altars and this pole that you are to worship. Now, Asherah was a, a sexual goddess that was out there in, in like pornography type stuff. And this is who he had built for them to worship. So we need to go back then and define, we understand an altar, we understand who Baal is, we understand who Asherah is, they were idols that they were worshiping. So what is an idol? We need to define these things so we can understand why God is about to deal with this. An idol is an unauthorized person, place, or thing that you look to to meet the needs in your life. It is an unauthorized person, place, or thing that you use to meet the issues of your life. Now, we may say in America that we don't build idols like other foreign countries do. I would beg to differ with you. I would beg to differ with you. There are idols, if we are not careful, in all of our lives. There are things that we set up and we worship more than we worship God, if you don't believe it, all you have to do is start talking about some specific areas and talking to people about giving those up so that they can get closer to God, and all of a sudden, an idol will crop up. Because if it's not an idol, you have no trouble dealing with it. If it's not an idol, you have no trouble dealing with it, okay? So, we go on, and Elijah is told, God tells him, he said, I want you to go to this place, and, and I'm going to give you an address, and I want you to go there because there's some things about to happen. So God tells Elijah, I am going to attack their idols at the very source, and here's what happens. God showed them in just a moment, that he is the only God. How is it that God attacked the idol at the source? He went and he told Elijah, he said, you go to them and you tell them this God Baal that they worship to produce their crops and make them have a big harvest, this God Asherah that they worship to produce and all of these things, I'm about to show you who the real God is. And he told Elijah, he said, you go to that wicked king Ahab and you tell him for the period of three and a half years, it is not going to rain. Now, any of you who deal with crops or animals or anything like that, what would it do to you if there were three and a half years of no rain? Not a drop. Do nothing. Nothing. No wetness, no dew in the morning, nothing. It would cripple you. It would cripple your country because you weren't prepared. What if God came and said today, he said, hey guys, Evangel, that rain y'all just got, last you're having for three and a half years. It won't even, there won't even be dew in the morning. It's going to be dry. It would cut us off. So here's the first thing that you need to understand in this principle. The idols in your life will be attacked by God. The idols in your life will be attacked. You can use the word addressed. You can use whatever you want there. But they are going to show up. God tells Elijah, I'm going to send you to this brook. The name of this brook is Cherith. Cherith means to cut off or to cut away. He said, I want you to go to this place, this brook called Cherith, and I'm going to cut you off. I'm going to move you away from everybody and everything that is going on. In essence, God tells Elijah, separate yourself from everything that's going on because I'm about to show you my power in a, in a powerful way. He said, there's going to be a turn down in the economy, but I'm going to take care of you. It's not going to affect you. God told Elijah that he was going to take care of him in two different ways. Number one, he told him, I'm going to take care of you naturally. He said, I'm going to take care of you naturally. He said, there's going to be a brook that I'm sending to you. That brook has been running, so I'm going to take you there. It is a natural source 
where you can get the water that you need. You're going to drink fresh water while everybody else is in the middle of a drought. The next thing he told him is, I'm going to provide for you supernaturally. Supernaturally. How did he provide for him supernaturally? Well, he told him, I'm going to send ravens. And they're going to come and they're going to feed you bread and meat morning and evening. So in essence, I'm bringing a sandwich into you and it is being delivered by the ravens. You've got water to drink and you've got bread and everything that you're going to use. Here's what we didn't really realize in this. That the animals that were bringing the bread... And the meat to Elijah, according to Deuteronomy, were unclean animals that he was not even to have any association with. God told him, he said, I'm going to provide for you naturally, but I'm going to provide for you supernaturally. Why would God tell Elijah that he is going to provide for him through unclean animals? It's because God was showing him, I can use whatever I want to, to make a miracle happen. That's where the miracle gets messy. Because Elijah is a prophet. He's not supposed to touch this stuff. Not supposed to have anything to do with it. And God tells him, don't you put me in a box. He said, I know what it says. I'm the God of the word. I'm the God of the word, but I can take anything I need to, and I can switch it around. Sounds like Peter, when he was up on the rooftop, and the, <clears throat> the vision came, and the blanket came down, and there was all kind of food, and God said, eat. The angel told him, eat. He goes, I'm not going to eat of that. It's unclean. And he said, don't call anything that God has created unclean. So here's what I'm telling you today. Don't be surprised if God uses something out of the ordinary at an unexpected time that you may think is not the way God should do it to meet a miracle that is in your life. Number two, God must be your only source. Number two, God must be your only source. Number one, God will attack the idols that are in your life. Elijah said, I can't mess with that. God said, hey, don't you tell me. Don't you tell me, I can do whatever I need to. And now he's about to show him that I'm the source. He's feeding him. He's doing all of those things. Everything in your life is only a resource that can be used by the source. Everything that we have is only a resource. We've, we've talked about the tithe. We've talked about the first fruits. We've talked about all of those things. All that you have is only a resource that is given to you by the source. Okay? That's something, if you're jotting down on your notes, you need to jot that. That's a, that's, that's a statement there that, that can be used over and over and over in your life. Verse number 7, the brook dries up. Just because God is providing today doesn't mean it may stop tomorrow. Just because God's providing today doesn't mean that it may dry up and he's about to show you that I can take care of you in another way. Never look to man as your source. Never look to man as your source. I've told you this over and over again in this church. Never look to myself or the leadership and put any of us that we're not supposed to make mistakes or anything like that. I'm as human as you are. Our leadership is as human as you are. We are not the source, we are a resource that is being used by the source. Why is it not raining? Why is these things not going on? Because Elijah had been told for three and a half years that judgment is coming. The brook dries up. And Elijah, when it dried up, was Elijah out of God's will? No. Was Elijah still in God's will when the brook dried up? Then why did the brook dry up? Because sometimes God is moving you to another place when the brook dries up. Elijah was happy here. Hey, I got sandwiches being delivered to me morning and evening. I got water right here. 
And he goes, everything is good. They're up there thirsting and everything like that. And God tells Elijah, I'm not finished with you yet. There's more miracles that I need to show you. And I need you to be a resource for me. So the brook dries up. And what happens then? The word of the Lord comes to him. When did the word of the Lord come to him? When things had dried up. The word of the Lord came to Elijah. And what you need to understand is that when something dries up in your life, it could be that God is sending you to another provider. To another provider that is in there. So, God tells Elijah in verse number 9 to go to Zarephath. Here again, he is telling him, I'm going to take care of you. Here are a couple of things that make you go, hmm. Okay, a couple of things that make you go, hmm. Zarephath was the capital of Baal worship. What was God dealing with the people about? Baal worship. He had told Elijah, he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send you away, and you're going to be provided for. And then all of a sudden, the brook dries up, and Elijah's thinking, sweet, I'm going to the Bahamas now. It's going to be great. There's not dry over there. You're going to send me to another fertile place. No. God sends him of all things, are you ready, to a widow. Really? You're sending me. Everything has dried up. Zarephath was the bell belt. We're the Bible belt. It was the bell belt. And God, what you need to understand is this. God will often test your faith by sending you to places you don't want to go. God will often test your faith by sending you to places, sounds like a missions thing here to me, or situations that you don't want to be in. God told him, go to the capital of Baal worship. Here's the third principle you need to understand. When I act, God acts. When I act, God acts. A lot of times we want God to act, but what does James tell us? Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. You act, and then God acts. Okay? Here's what happened. Verse number 13, it says this. It says, um, and Elijah said to her, let's, I'll tell you what, let's back up and read a little bit more, because this is, this is pretty important. Go to verse 8. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, and he said, Arise and go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and behold, and dwell there. And behold, I have commanded a widow there to feed you. So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow was gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, Bring me a little water. Now, she doesn't know this guy. This guy shows up. All of a sudden, what does he do? He walks in. It's a dry season. And he goes, hey, bring me some water. How many of you think water is a precious commodity in a dry season? I do. He tells her, bring me something that is precious to you. But evidently, she acknowledged him somehow as a prophet or a man of God. And so she does it. She goes to get him the water. And as she was going to bring it, he called to her and said, Oh, by the way, if you don't mind to, bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. And she said, As the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked. She said, I haven't I hadn't prepared anything. I can get you the water, but I ain't baked. Only a, I have only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. And now, she's telling him her situation, and now I am gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. How many of you think this is a grave situation? How many of you think this, this is a messy miracle? It's not God is all of a sudden she goes, hey, I walked in, and all of a sudden there's cinnamon rolls, and there's muffins, and there's biscuits, and everything on my bread. That, that would be the miracle that you would kind of think. Walk in there, and all of a sudden, poof, there's bread there. That's not how God works. Sometimes God's miracles are messy. Sometimes God's miracles are challenging. Sometimes God's miracles are beyond what we can see, feel, and think. Okay? Goes on. Says, I'm going to die. And Elijah said to her, do not fear. Really? 
Go and do as I have said, but first, but first. Could this also be a principle that we talked about of the tithe? But first, but first make me a little cake of it and bring it to me. And afterward, make something for yourself and your son. See, God sometimes will tell us that he wants us to act before he will act on our behalf. How many times have we prayed, God, get me out of this mess, and God is going, if you will take a step in the direction of helping, I will do the rest of the steps. We just stand there, and we're waiting for the miracle. God, if you will, poof, I need a miracle. And God's going, so what are you doing to help? I'm going to use a word here that, that may shock you, to provoke me to do a miracle. What are you doing that shows me you, you're really serious about this? Sometimes it means us taking care of the things of God so that God can take care of our things. Are you with me? This could get into serving in so many different ways. This could get into serving. What are you doing for the kingdom of God that would have God acknowledge you? What He told her, he said, I realize what you're telling me, that you feel like, listen to me, I'm about to get where the rubber meets the road. I realize you, you telling me you're tired of serving. I realize you're telling me you're tired of being the one that you feel like is always doing. I realize you're telling me these things, but here's what I'm telling you. You're complaining to me about not having energy, and you're complaining to me about not having passion anymore when you have stopped the source by which I infuse you with those things. That's an amen or oh me. You have stopped by which I infuse you with those things. How many of you think that if we want God to serve things in our life and to do things in our life that we need to be doing things for the kingdom of God and investing time back into it? It's a no-brainer. It's a no-brainer. God is telling us many times in this, we limit him because we limit ourselves. And here's what God is telling her. He told her through, through Elijah, he said, you see, I'm telling you this. Do what I'm telling you to, and I will show you a miracle. Selena, if I can get you to come, please. You see, the Bible says here, here's what Elijah said. Do as I have said, but first make me a little cake and bring it to me, and afterward make something for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord. That's an underlinable point right there. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel. He's, he's getting pinpointed on this. The jar of flour will not be spent or will not run out. And the jug of oil shall not be empty until the day that the Lord sends rain upon the earth. How many of you think this miracle is about to get messy for this woman? This is what I call a messy thing. Well, Lord, what if you don't? I wonder how many miracles we what if you don't ourselves out of. I wonder what kind of just phenomenal things in our life that God wants to do and we well what if you don't ourself right out of them but what if he does what if he does well pastor is this going to happen if I do it now is God going to come through next week for me it's, it's about the faith that you're building for the provision to come you're building a bridge from the natural to the supernatural. 
every time you step out in faith. Every time you step out in faith. And here's what it goes on and says. And she went and did as Elijah said. And she and he and her household ate for many days. You know what that tells me? God took Elijah from the brook Cherith, which is the brook of separation. And he spoke to him there. He said, God, I'm going to, Elijah, I'm going to show you I can do some things for you. I'm going to put you by a brook that's not going to run dry, even though everything else is drying up. I'm going to send ravens that are, di- that are, are defined as unclean to feed you. I'm going to send you to Zarephath, the capital of Baal worship. But there in the capital of Baal worship, you're going to find a woman who evidently understands the principles and has a heart after God in all of this mess. And I want you then to challenge her faith. And I want you to tell her to take those sticks and that little bit of flour and that little bit of oil. And I want you to tell her to feed you first. Feed the things of God first. Did you get that? Feed the things of God first. Do the God things first. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then all these things will be added unto you. And the Bible says that she, he, and her household ate for many days. So what does that show me? That Elijah stayed there for a number of days and they were taken care of. What were they taken care of off of? A couple of sticks, some flour that she only had enough for her and her son a little bit, and oil that she only had enough for her and her son a little bit. And God said, you give me the little bit and I'll give you the lot. You see, too many people want the miracle, but they don't want to be the instigator of a miracle. When Hannah wanted a baby, she told God she was willing to give the baby back to him to serve in the kingdom. The boy that had the lunch, he told him, he said, all I've got is just this. I know there's 5,000 men out here not counting women and children. And he said, but if you want my lunch here, you can have it. And what happens? The boy took more than he gave back home. And I've told you this before. I kind of believe that the boy took it back, and some of their friends actually came and had a meal with them. This is just me speculating and going a little bit further with it. I think they came, hey, come here and see what God did. We had a little bit, but we've got a lot. Y'all come and eat with us. How did this happen? I don't know. My son went, and this man named Jesus you know, was asking if anybody had anything. The disciples were, and he goes, well, I've got, you know, I've got five loaves, two fishes. You know, it's my sandwich. And uh, so they said, well, can we have it? Sure. And look what he brought back. And there's all these baskets. Proverbs eleven twenty five: Whoever brings blessing will be enriched. And the one who waters will himself be watered. Great scripture. Whoever brings blessing will be enriched, and the one who waters will himself be watered. Ecclesiastes 11.1, cast your bread upon the waters, for you will find it after many days. That means it's going to come back to you. So, Elijah invoked her faith, and her faith helped provide the miracle that God supplied. So here's my question to you. Who's your source? Who's your source? Once you truthfully answer that, you will begin to understand the freedom that there is in God. You'll understand the miracle may be messy. You may not understand it. But God said... It tells us in the word, I've never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging for bread. 
When we do for God, God will do for us. And by the way, there are people who may say, well, that's an Old Testament story. You know, that was way back there. Luke 4, 24, Jesus is talking. And he said, I tell you, there were many widows in the days of Elijah. When the heavens were shut up for three years and six months, and a great famine came over all the land, and Elijah was sent to none of them but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon to a woman who was a widow. God acknowledged what had happened. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Miracles can be messy. Miracles can be messy. Sometimes we don't know where they're going to come from. We don't know how the things are going to happen. And God calls us to do something that seems just so outrageous. Really, God? Do you know the need that I have? Do you know the brook is dried up? You're going to send me over here? Well, God, this doesn't make sense. That, that doesn't look like a very godly way to supply my need. I'm not talking about sin or anything. I'm talking about the unexplainable. And here's what God says. If you will provide for me, I will provide for you. You may be here today and you may say, you know what, I'm just weary in serving. I'm weary in doing this. It seems like all I do is pour out. It never comes back in. Here's what I'm telling you today. Cast your bread on the water and it will come back to you. Whenever you do what God has told you to, the miracle will come. The miracle may be messy. You may have to go through things to get to the miracle. We don't like that. There's things I've been through in my life, and I'm like, God, this makes absolutely no sense. It seems like you are devoid of this issue. And God said, no, 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 you don't understand. I'm sending you to Cherith. I'm going to separate you away from this. Then, yeah, it may look like the enemy has control, but I'm telling you, there's provision that you don't even understand. Kind of sounds like Abraham, doesn't it? All of a sudden, there's a lamb in the thicket, a ram sitting over there. I don't know where you are today, but I want to tell you this. Don't give up on your faith. Don't give up on your serving. Don't give up on the things of God. Because you may be right on the brink of a miracle that has been messy that God is going to show up in.